Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. So welcome again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow for so many people out there. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Ambassador Dr. John Kangasong, who is United States Global AIDS Coordinator and Special Representative for Health Diplomacy, a position he was sworn into uh, on June uh, 2022, where he leads, manages, and oversees the United States President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, also known as PEPFAR, the largest commitment by uh, any nation to address a single disease in history, which has helped prevent millions of HIV infections, save lives, and ultimately help make progress towards ending the HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, Dr. Ken Wilson was previously uh, appointed the first director of the Africa Center for Disease Control, headquartered in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and through his leadership there. He grew that organization into a fully autonomous health agency of the African Union. Uh, he also led uh, the COVID-19 response in Africa, coordinating with various heads of state and government across the continent, uh, ultimately securing for over 400 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine during the, uh, the height of the vaccine scarcity. Prior to that, uh, he served uh, at USCDC uh, in the Division of Global HIV and the Tuberculosis International Laboratory Branch Chief and Associate Director of Laboratory Sciences. Uh, he also served as Acting Deputy Director of CDC, Center for Global Health, and Co-Chair of PEPFAR's uh, Lab Tech Working Group. He is on the board of uh, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, CEPI, uh, over in Norway, uh, originally got his bachelor's degree uh, from the University of London in Cameroon, his master's from the International Tropical Medicine uh, Center in Antwerp, PhD, uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Brussels in Belgium. Um, an extensive list of awards that I will put in the bio of the show, uh, but uh, just excited to get going. Ambassador Dr. John Kingelsong, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. You know, it, it was great. It's great having you. I uh, I very much, you know, yesterday enjoyed watching you on C-SPAN in front of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing, talking about sort of the 20th anniversary uh, of PEPFAR. I'd like to start off, though, if we could, 10 years prior to that, because I think, you know, when we go back to the early 90s, it's at this time where you... Um, you know, you first start publishing on some really unique strains of HIV in Cameroon and Gabon. Uh, you start working with Dr. Peter Piot at the time. And, you know, I'd love to just get your perspective, at, you know, at a time when this was seen as a death sentence only 30 years ago, this amazing transition that you've been involved in as we made it not just a livable condition, but, you know, per some of what we've been discussing on other shows, potentially with some free exposure prophylaxis, some of the new antiviral treatments, a potentially curable one in the near future. Reflect a bit on sort of the early days, if you would. No, thank you so much. The early days of uh, HIV AIDS uh, pandemic were scary. They were, uh, they brought a lot of hopelessness to individuals, hopelessness to their families and hopelessness to the communities and the countries. And I was, I would say rather fortunate to join uh, work on HIV AIDS in 1988 uh, in my uh, country of birth in, in Cameroon. And I had just uh, graduated from school and in, around that time period, uh, the talk and the discussion around HIV AIDS was uh, around, but it was not like serious enough. And then, so I was truly just fortunate to have uh, committed myself and uh, develop an interest in, in virology at that time. 
uh, initially working on hepatitis uh, B, which until HIV AIDS came was one of the, the, the most uh, dreadest um, of the viruses that, that was out there. And then HIV joined that fight against HIV, uh, did my work at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, as you said, with uh, Peter Piot and Guido van der Groen in virology. And we were truly the first to begin to characterize that, that HIV came in different variants or, or subsets. Today, you hear about variants and everybody thinks about COVID, but we were describing <laughs> that about 30 years ago where we had uh, several subtypes and then there was the unique variant called HIV group O, which was really yeah. an outlayer of, of, of the HIV family. Of course, it was HIV too, had a privilege to do all of that. But forward, fast forward, um, 1996 became pivotal, where uh, in the AIDS conference in Vancouver for the first time, uh, findings from uh, researchers like David Ho, who was uh, at that time, I'm, I'm sure he's still there now, at the Aaron Diamond uh, yep. uh, AIDS Research uh, uh, Foundation, showed that if you use a cocktail of highly active antiretroviral therapy, you could beat down viremia and people could, uh, their, their CD4 counts rebound and they, they started living normal life. But it was really expensive at that time. Uh, the cost of treatment was like $10,000 to $12,000 per year per patient. So the drugs were available in the developed world, uh, where, of course, the burden of disease was not as severe as in the developing world. And there were no drugs in the developing world, especially Africa, where the disease was. So you had a dichotomy of uh, the presence of the disease with no drugs or access to drugs and availability of the drugs, and then with a, a, a fairly relatively um, lower burden of the disease. So that is where we also a, a tipping point where I became intrigued. I, I joined the US CDC in 1994, then worked, moved to Cote d'Ivoire in 1998. Together with the UNAIDS, uh, we started a UNAIDS Drug Access Initiative in 1998, 1998. So to tease out a basic concept as to whether you could bring those expensive drugs into treatment in, in Africa and Uganda, uh, 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 Uganda, Cote d'Ivoire were two countries in Africa. UNAIDS also uh, uh, picked Vietnam and I believe um, Vietnam and another country in, in, in the Western Hemisphere that they were to be a pilot countries. We learned a lot from there that it was possible because at that time people said, well, it was very difficult to introduce ARVs into cocktail. I mean, here we are in an era of, of HAG in, in Africa. And uh, but we demonstrated that it was possible. And uh, fast forward, uh, PEPFA was launched in 2003, um, and the Global Fund be, be, before that. So the the dynamics and the trajectory of the response to the global HIV AIDS just changed uh, uh, significantly. And you know, I, I was just you know I was listening to uh, an interview you gave on uh, National Public Radio a couple weeks ago. It was you and and Dr. Uh, Helene Gale who who spent several a couple decades at CDC as well. And you're both talking about um, you know the the dramatic amount of deaths and infections that have been reduced, the millions of doses uh, of ART that you've gotten out there, as well as sort of this theme of. Um, economies that were on the verge of collapse that you know turned around entirely yet the topic of the show which was it was the the most successful global public plan that you've never heard of um say a couple words about that as well if you would because clearly you know you're at CDC Africa CDC WHO advisor you're seeing PEPFAR <laughs> through the lens of it happening why why do we not know as much about it as we should it's it's something that everyone should know about i think it's something everyone should know about it. I characterize that as being vulnerable to our own success. Yeah. And that, and I also see that in the lens of what I typically characterize as a pandemic memory loss. And mm -hmm. you see those two all the time go hand in hand. And so let me expand on the uh, being vulnerable to our own success, which is uh, the ugly face of HIV AIDS. I mean, as I said, 20 years ago, was everywhere. I mean, you when you arrive in a country in Africa, like my trip to Uganda, I remember that vividly in 1992, I landed at the airport in Entebbe and was driving to the capital, to the capital Kampala. And what you saw along the roads 
was uh, uh, small boutiques that were selling coffins. So the coffin market was thriving, and you saw coffins line up from the small, the smaller, and it got. I mean, it was like almost like a pyramid, right? And the base mm -hmm. would be a big coffin, then a smaller coffin, a smaller coffin, I mean, which means they were all ready for whoever would die in that age group. And it was almost like the age pyramid in Africa. So whoever mm -hmm. died could just go get your coffin dead, and what uh, I mean, it's so funerals were like, like every day's activities. So. It was ugly. That's what I mean by the, the, the helplessness. Was that on the news every day? It was on the news every day. Then Pepford and Global Fund came. They've cleaned all of that. And I remember HIV AIDS is a generational issue now. And the people that are now vulnerable to, most vulnerable to it, the young, uh, the adolescent uh, girls and young women and young people as a whole, didn't see that ugly face of HIV AIDS. So the story has shifted. And we live in a world with competing priorities and the more disruptive pandemics have occurred now, like the Ebola outbreak, the COVID, and each time these disruptive pandemics occur, they push HIV to, to, to the back, okay? Especially given that we've cleaned up that ugly face of HIV AIDS. That's why you don't hear that a lot. But HIV AIDS is still a serious threat. Uh, last year alone, we re recorded 1.5 million new infections. Uh, there were almost uh, 450,000 deaths globally, of which 425,000 were in Africa. So uh, Africa still faces a big, big challenge of uh, HIV AIDS, despite the remarkable progress. So that is one. I call it being vulnerable to our success. Now, the pandemic memory loss is where uh, an outbreak or a pandemic happens, and then we all mobilize uh, uh, assets, global health assets, financial assets, you deal with it. And then uh, people move on, okay? And you forget that uh, what happened. You see this a lot. Uh, we saw that during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, where 11,000 people, Ebola surprised us in capital cities. And suddenly we were fighting Ebola in cities like Freetown, Morovia, and, and Guinea, Conakry. And after that, if you read the reports that follow, it was like, uh, uh, never again, let's be prepared. And uh, then we move on because, because we got to deal with that, we move on. COVID came and I'd just like you to reflect on where you were when COVID started spreading broadly in, in the US. The panic you had in New yeah. York City was shut down. I want you to have, have a pin, pin a picture of New York City being shut down and people are not on the streets. I also want you now to reflect on where we are now. If you pull somebody in the streets of New York, City and you said, do you remember three years ago how scary it was in this city? There, they said, oh yeah, we remember that at uh, that <laughs> moment. And but they just move on, right? That is the memory loss in that. I mean, we we react, uh, 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 we we are frightened by the situation. Then we move on. So and and, and those are repeated cycles that uh, uh, did not fit well into preparing uh, a pandemic preparedness going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, as you mentioned, um, sort of. Uh, some of the issues with uh, co-infections, and, and, and you know, you know, you pointed out during this interview that there's a we're, we're, there's a lot of ne next fronts in terms of uh, public health system strengthening, importance for biosurveillance, um, and I thought it would be interesting to take a look because you know you've been innovating, publishing on these topics for years now, uh, some which are quite pertinent today. And I thought we would we could go through each of these. And a, an interesting place to start, I thought, would be um, your recent uh, Lancet HIV article in 2022 of May, uh, where it's called HIV and COVID-19 Juxtaposition of Two Pandemics, talking about how, as you were mentioning, the COVID crisis not just brought COVID, but it, it's significantly impacted the amount of people that we've been starting HIV testing and treatment back in the 2020 time period. It was, it's interesting because it sort of paralleled another paper you did with actually Ambassador Burks 10 years prior talking about the trouble with HIV and dealing with TB and malaria simultaneously. Say a few words about where you think we need to be looking, how we need to be innovating around some of these co-infections and comorbidities in that context. I think, let me uh, repeat what I've, been, I've said uh, severally. And um, at times you say that in a different period of your career and you hope that you are wrong because right. you are still a mid-level and then you, the more you, you age into that uh, your, your career, you just realize that what you said at that time is still right. Mm -hmm. I've always been a, 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 a proponent and that's why uh, Dr. Burks and I wrote that paper about establishing systems for HIV that had uh, a broad 
uh, outlook to, to supporting the response to other infectious diseases. When we wrote that paper at that time, we hadn't had a massive Ebola outbreak in West Africa. We didn't have COVID. Uh, and today, if you read that paper, you probably think uh, it is today's uh, paper, right? Right. right. <laughs> so now, if you now come back to the paper on uh, the, the Lancet HIV, which uh, uh, speaks to the, the juxtaposition of the two um, uh, pandemics. And if you look at the systems that we use in fighting COVID-19, and you draw a parallel with the systems that we have used over the years in fighting HIV AIDS, with the exception of a vaccine on the COVID column, you have exactly the same systems on, 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 on the, 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 the HIV columns, right? You mm -hmm. have, what do you need? You need a trained workforce, you need laboratory systems and network, you need uh, a transport systems and commodities, you need that uh, the good policies are, are, are in place. And with the exception of a vaccine, uh, it's the same thing. So that leads me to what I've said repeatedly, that the best way to prepare for the unknowns is to adequately uh, 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 fund the knowns. The knowns that we're dealing with today is HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. Okay, and that is what, if we strengthen those systems, the very with the intentionality of uh, uh, that we know now know that these outbreaks, that is the COVID, the Ebola, are occurring more frequently. Then we are preparing ourselves almost deliberately in fighting these other um, uh, uh, outbreaks. Mm -hmm. Moving to um, to the theme of uh, biosurveillance, and, and you know, a couple months ago, Dr. Ogwell uh, joined us, talked a little bit about sort of the genomics uh, surveillance per Africa CDC, um, and quite recently uh, in the Lancet, uh, you you published uh, actually along with Dr. Okariki, uh, who was just on the show, um, global and regional governance of One Health and implications for global health security, and obviously the One Health theme has been quite. Uh, hot lately, uh, needless to say. Um, you, This paper is fascinating because not only do you say, okay, we have uh, human and domestic health experts, animal health experts, but you have to bring other people to the table for to make really one health make sense in terms of other sectors, other professionals in all aspects. And you have some really interesting examples of locust infest, uh, infestations and uh, the water resources in the, in the Lake Chad Basin. There's a lot more to One Health than just, you know, the pathogen screening. Talk a little bit about your visions, if you would, for One Health per per this important era that we're in. So One Health is uh, clearly what we we should focus on uh, to address uh, global health security uh, as a core principle, and because um, the world we live in is 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 changing significantly. I mean, let's look at uh, what are some of the the factors that are leading to the emergence and re-emergence, and even at a very rapid pace of in these infectious diseases. One is population growth. I mean, we have the same landmass, but the population has escalated. Uh, in, when WHO, for example, was established in 1948, the, world was, the world's population was around 2.5 billion people. Today, we are 8 billion after 75 years. Uh, I give you an example to follow that uh, that line of thinking. Um, in DRC in 1976, when the first Ebola outbreak was detected, uh, the, the population of that country was around 20, 20 something million, about 27 to be very specific. Today, it is uh, the population of DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, is around is over one 100 million people. Uh, but is it the same landmass that I mean, you have? So mm. people have to now uh, put pressure on in, into the existing ecosystem for road, for food. And, and in doing that, you encroach into difficult ecosystems. And then we get in, in touch with uh, uh, other species that uh, before we were not, uh, as human beings, we are not exposed to that. Second is climate change. We see uh, the, 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 the changes in, in, in climate that lead to all kinds of dynamics. And we should also factor that in. The movement of people, the, the rate at which we move nowadays is significantly more than it was. I, I always look at the, 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 the spread of COVID-19. Within uh, 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 20 days, COVID spread already uh, from, it started in Wuhan and spread to over 166 countries in 20 days. Okay, that shows you how quickly that, I mean, a, a pathogen anywhere in the world that emerges is a threat everywhere in the world. 
So I think, I mean, and, and other factors that um, uh, 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 we, we have. But the beauty of that is that we, we have developed our tools. The people that fought the pandemic, the 1918 pandemic, the, the Spanish flu, will be envious of us today and said, oh, goodness me, within <laughs> one month, they were able to identify a test. Goodness me, within one year, they were able to uh, uh, characterize the virus, develop a vaccine, go through clinical trials, and put it in people's arms. Remember the Spanish flu in 1918 was overcome and they didn't even know what they were dealing with. They didn't know the sequences until 1936 where they published that this, this sequence. So the pandemic was over. They just used a, a very primitive uh, public health uh, uh, practices or what are called standard public health practices to fight the pandemic until uh, 1936 where they sequenced the virus and all that. But we knew the sequence after uh, uh, four weeks, and so it could enable us to design drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines. There. So significant challenges that we have in the area of emerging infectious diseases, which all speak to one herd, uh, because 70 to 80 percent of our infections are coming from animals, right? And now we, we see a uh, weather change, uh, 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 vector-borne diseases are, are now uh, 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 spreading for the and, and others, I mean, and lack of water leads to cholera outbreaks and, and others. So we have to look at this from a holistic point and say, how do we bring in a, a, a health security from the lens of addressing climate change, food safety and security, because food safety is different from security. I would argue that that person in DRC who goes into the remote area to look for a source of protein is because they don't have a source of protein. So mm -hmm. they need to go into that remote area and then encroach into an ecosystem that will expose them to, to bats, infections, and whatever. And then they bring the COVID, sorry, they bring Ebola into um, uh, the, the, the cities and all of us are affected. So that's the way we should be looking at. But to do that, just to end on this piece, is that we have to look at our global health security architecture in three dimensions. What I, I've been preaching a lot is we need to think globally, we need to act regionally, and we need to implement nationally. And, and that, that um, that's a perfect segue into my next uh, question because I, you know, you you're instrumental in in, uh, in organizing the Africa CDC Institute for Pathogenomics in 2019. You published in 2020, um, Africa needs a new public health order to tackle infectious disease threats. And, and, and again, here we come into the new order, uh, talking about not just continental, but national public health institutions, manufacturing of vaccines, of therapeutics, of diagnostics, and of course, attracting and training uh, the workforce. And it's very interesting because you put up a map in this paper um, and it basically shows you know, COVID and HIV aren't really on this. Well, they are, but you have Lhasa, cholera, dengue, Ebola, anthrax, Congo hemorrhagic fever, a lot of other things happening that you know need to be part of this uh, health system strengthening slash resilience slash innovation <laughs> equation. Talk about some of your vision for uh, this per Africa, if you would. So let me uh, speak to that vision from my previous uh, life, uh, yeah. which is just about 10 months. Uh, 10 months ago, I was uh, the, the, the head of the Africa CDC. Uh, they now have a new director, uh, Dr. Jean Kisseyad, and whom um, that we all should support so that he should carry forward his, uh, the, the vision of what, uh, what we started. Uh, when I was at Africa CDC, it occurred to me that there were five areas that uh, you needed to focus on. In other words, have you, 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 you are familiar with the saying that if you are everything to everybody, then you are nothing to, to everybody, right? So I mean, so I, I wanted to define Africa CDC on what its unique role could be. And there were five areas of focus that I thought uh, Africa CDC could play a role. I mean, promote workforce, uh, given that on the continent of Africa, you had only one epidemiologist. Uh, um, you needed 6,000 epidemiologists on a continent of uh, 1.3 billion people. They currently only have about 1,800, 1,900. Uh, so workforce as a whole, right? including community health care workers, uh, is critical. That was uh, uh, a key area. Another area was strengthening uh, uh, in, uh, institutions as a whole, like the Africa CDC, uh, the African Medicine uh, Agency, and then the National Public Health Institute. But do that in a way that they are networked, because Africa is a huge continent. I mean, the West Africa alone is 400 million people, and you needed to create a network in that region so that 
um, Africa CDC becomes a network, uh, a, an organization that builds on different networks on the continent. And then manufacturing of diagnostics, pharmaceutical and, and uh, therapeutics, which uh, until COVID hit, Africa imported 99% of its vaccines, um, almost 80% uh, of its drugs. I mean, that's not the way you, you prepared 1.4 billion people against a health security mm -hmm. threat. And then uh, mobilize domestic resources uh, as much as possible, domestic resources, meaning financing, and lastly, uh, what I call uh, partnerships. Be, be, make sure that partnerships are aligned with where the continent was, was going so that you, you can create more efficiencies as much as possible. So that's the whole core uh, concept of a new public health order that way. And it's interesting that when I look back at those five areas there, we, we acted across those five pillars very, very clearly. I mean, then uh, we had a network of national public health institutes and supported other countries to develop some. We promoted aggressively the concept of vaccine production. We developed uh, the, the uh, Africa, um, the Partnership for Africa Vaccine Manufacturing, uh, PBAM, where we stated clearly that we needed, the continent needed to get to uh, a 60% production in the next, I think, 20 years or, or, or so, which was quite doable. And I'm very excited to see the remarkable movement that is happening on the continent on vaccine manufacturing. Dr. Tedros is in South Africa, I think yesterday or today with the mRNA hubs. I think that was all the movement. I remember hosting a meeting, calling a meeting, convening that meeting where uh, four head of states came on, on that platform, including President Kagame, President Sisekedi, and Ramaphosa from South Africa, and, and, and to all agreed for, to move in that direction. There were 40,000 people on that platform. On uh, That was April 21st, 22nd, 2021. Uh, a lot of movement happening. I'm happy to see that Pasteur Institute in Senegal and a group in Morocco are now producing uh, diagnostics, a rapid tests for uh, a COVID uh, testing with, and, and PCR tests, which was not there before. Uh, also pleased to see that in terms of the workforce area that we started a Kofi Annan uh, leader, Global Health Leadership Program because you have to think across the workforce in strata. Right. I mean, who are the leaders? So that uh, program is in the, the, the third cohort where you bring senior people and you arm them with skills, holistic skills in global health diplomacy, global health advocacy and global health as a, as, as a, a, a developmental and economic uh, 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 dimension. So all of that, I mean, we started all of that. And I think I'm, I'm hoping to see that, I mean, these partnerships or, or this program continue. One of the greatest partnerships that we developed was with the MasterCard Foundation. Again, mm -hmm. as part of that five component was a $1.5 billion donation from the MasterCard to support that uh, vaccine uh, uh, rollout, COVID vaccine rollout, by strengthening Africa CDC as well as uh, uh, other institutions. So when I review those five areas of uh, a new public health order, I'm very pleased that we started a movement in that direction. And I'm, I'm also pleased to see that the new Director of Africa CDC uh, is committing to continuing in, in that direction. Outstanding, really outstanding work. Um, so again, as I mentioned yesterday, we all got a chance to uh, watch you presenting, talking to the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee. The the topic of uh, the meeting was PEPFAR at twenty, achieving a sustainable uh, and sustainable academic ep epidemic control. Sorry about that. Um, Talk a little bit about uh, the hearing, if you would. And, you know, we had um, Secretary Pace on uh, from HHS a couple of weeks ago talking about global health diplomacy. Um, what, what do you want to see for the, the, the coming years in terms of PEPFAR and, and continuing its mission? Because, again, as you mentioned in this this hearing, um, a lot of work that we've come a long way, but still. Uh, there's things that need to be done here. Talk a little bit about the hearing and a little bit of what you'd like to see in terms of the global uh, health diplomacy perspective as leading PEPFAR now. No, thank you so much. I, good. We, we, if you ask me one of the greatest lessons I've learned with PEPFAR and Global Fund, I would say that uh, they all symbolize and characterize where good politics leads to good global health outcomes and save lives. So that is almost an equation that I remind myself every day when I wake up in the morning, that the importance of good politics plus uh, good public health practice save lives. 
So I start there because uh, we would not have a PEPFAR if we didn't have good politics. We're the two, uh, by, uh, PEPFAR has been strongly supported, consistently supported by a bipartisan approach. And you could see that two days ago in, in the, uh, the, the, the briefing that I had with, or the hearing at the Senate, they're, they're very supportive. But what actually makes that hearing more important to me is that there is a strong oversight that uh, the, the, the Senate has, uh, or the Hill is, is, has on, on PEPFAR, watching that carefully, making sure that they support it, and that it continues to be a data-driven, result-oriented, and impactful program. That, that is remarkable. That is what truly makes it unique. That is good politics, uh, uh, focusing on the right things to do, which is saving lives. What else can be so important in humanity than saving lives? Yeah. PEPFAR has saved 25 million lives prevented the, the, the transmission of 5.5 uh, million uh, infections in, for, in children, prevented 5.5 million, which could, could have been easily deaths from, uh, from HIV. And in doing that, strengthening overall health systems in, 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 in partner countries there. So incredibly important and uh, remarkable achievement. But as I said earlier, at the start of this conversation, uh, that fight is not over. Uh, we are making very uh, uh, good progress, but that progress is fragile. We all almost need to remind ourselves that if you take off uh, our uh, 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 eyes on the ball uh, by relenting on providing ARVs to this, uh, the, those who are infected, within almost three weeks to four weeks, the virus comes back. And that means two things. Uh, you, the patient will die and it, he or she will transmit the virus. So we just have to remind ourselves every day of that, that our, our success is fragile. But also remind ourselves that uh, science is on our side, where we started from a cocktail of drugs in 1996 to one pill a day, okay, which, which is doable. I mean, and who knows what science will bring uh, 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 in future. It could be that the long-acting preps and long-acting treatment becomes um, the standard of care. And it could be that, I mean, also projecting into the distant future that truly you have a cure. But Let's really be remain hopeful that uh, science continues to progress in the way that it has uh, brought us since 1996 and to where we are today. So I think that uh, I really want to uh, recognize the strong leadership that uh, the Congress continues to provide uh, in a bipartisan manner in, in moving PEPFAR forward. January 24th this year was uh, uh, an important day in Washington. It was a happy day in Washington where President Bush was in town and mm -hmm. uh, leaders from both parties and where they all gathered together to celebrate 20 remarkable years of saving lives. I think when people ask, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Daibo mentioned during his testimony, what PREPFA represents in Africa, it represents American people care. care. It represents American people care. I think we should never forget that. That projects, projects our values in a way that nothing else could have done in our own diplomacy. So it's a very strong uh, soft uh, power that we have out there and a soft power that speaks to our hearts, where our hearts are, and in respect to recognizing the suffering of others. Outstanding. Um, Ambassador, a couple, last year I was joined by both um, uh, Senator uh, Joe Lieberman and, and Congresswoman Donna Shalala on the show, who are part of uh, this bipartisan commission on biodefense, uh, creating this uh, Apollo program, as they say, for uh, the next generation of, of threats that, God forbid, are going to be coming along. Um, it's a you know a, a moonshot figure they're looking at in terms of a hundred billion dollars. Um, any any advice that you would give per the success um, that PEPFAR has had um, per some of these other moonshots, grand challenges, whatever you want to call them that we still are facing? Um, and you know, I, I'll leave that one. I mean, when I when 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 Dr. Gale uh, was on the show, you know, her her piece of advice was um, the thing that made HIV, in her opinion, it took it from a hundred million dollar issue to a hundred billion dollar issue, was that HIV patients uh, became the face of a movement. Um, any advice for uh, people that are looking at other things besides HIV in in, in this grand challenge context? 
I, I think we should take uh, the uh, we should recognize by now, and for those who have not really paid attention to to this, that uh, we live in an era of of, of, of pandemics, yeah. and uh, in 2022, WHO uh, had declared three public health emergency of international uh, uh, um, concerns. And that was Ebola, COVID, and I think uh, Mpox, right? So right. it's unusual to have three uh, figs going on at the same time. And, and it also tells you that uh, how uh, frequently these uh, outbreaks are occurring. Uh, Marburg in Tanzania, Marburg in Equatorial Guinea, and, and Ebola in Uganda, and it was Ebola um, Sudan, not uh, Zaire. Mm -hmm. So it only tells you that. And if you recall what I said earlier about a disease uh, outbreak anywhere is a, a threat everywhere in the world, and it takes less than 20 days for such a, 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 for that route to be completed, uh, given the lessons we learned from COVID. Uh, it, it also just that, I mean, such thinking that was put forward by the, the senators should be taken seriously. Uh, I would argue that one of our greatest threats uh, in modern times is the outbreak of an infectious respiratory disease. Mm. I want to paint a picture of, of a threat that it's not fiction. It's something we've lived with, and it's something that uh, nothing says that it cannot happen in the future. So let me remind you of 2002, uh, mm -hmm. where we had the first SARS outbreak, SARS COVID-1, uh, where the, the, the fatality rate was almost 15%. So in other words, uh, uh, if you had um, 100 people uh, infected, 15 of them died. Okay, very, very quickly. But the, 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 the advantage we had was that was twofold, that it was transmitted only when people was, had symptoms and it transmitted less. Okay, so that, that is one. So just keep that in mind, a fatality rate for a respiratory infection of 15%. 20 years down the road, you have a uh, SARS-CoV-2 that has a, a lesser fatality rate of about 3%, but spreads extremely fast. It spreads like smoke, right? Yep. And so I want you to think of SARS-CoV-3, where it has the, the, the properties of SARS-CoV-1 and spreads like SARS-CoV-2. And imagine where the world would be uh, uh, before you even get a vaccine in one year. It would be devastating. Just to remind you, and I end on that, that in 1918, within two years, almost 20% of the world's population was wiped up. Okay, because uh, at 20%, because the numbers stand at 50 to 100 million. In a world that was just around 500 million at that at that time, okay. So I mean, almost 100 million of, of 100 million of 500 million people that, that died. Yes, science is on our side, but if you face such a fast-moving uh, 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 pathogen with a fatality of what we saw 20 years ago, then we should uh, really. So all uh, all of that to say that we should really consider uh, uh, disease threats uh, as a serious security threat, as a serious national security threat, as Secretary Blinken has said, and a serious economic threat. Look at the trillions of dollars, about 14 to 15 trillions of dollars have evaporated because of these the economic stimulus. Look, we are still in an inflation. Economies in the world are still struggling because of, of COVID. So we have to prepare uh, in, the, in the lens of not return of our investment, but rather an insurance policy. You don't buy an insurance policy because you are sick. You buy the insurance policy because you think that one day you may need it. And the day that you need it, it comes to play. Countries don't buy uh, planes, war planes to go to war, but they buy it in case they need it. And for 30 years, that piece of equipment that you bought may never be used, but one day it might be used. So that's the way we should be looking at these health security threats um, at, at, at in, from the lens of how does the military prepare? Uh, to guarantee our security. How do you prepare yourself for those the bad days when you, you need an insurance and you probably don't need it now? Yeah. yeah. Um, while we're on that theme, I just, you know, I have to ask because I noticed that um, uh, in a couple of days, you're going to be um, keynoting at the uh, the World Sepsis Congress. And uh, again, the, the title of the, uh, the conference, One Global Health Threat, Sepsis Pandemics and Antimicrobial Resistance, and I have to say that, you know, this is, we've had a couple of guests on shouting about AMR um, and the problem that's coming. And, you know, the fact that we haven't developed new antibiotics in decades is just a piece of it. Sepsis is, sepsis has always been a problem for uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, 
you know, obviously you're a virologist. I think of you as a virologist, but this is another extremely important piece of um, the global pandemic equation with these anti, these drug resistant microbes. Can you just say a couple words about what you're going to be talking about uh, at the upcoming Congress? I, I will be talking about uh, taking a horizontal approach to that, that uh, at any rate, so let's forget about the threat and look at what we need to respond to that threat. Okay, I'll be talking about where we started this conversation at some point about what are the systems that we need to have in place, because if you have that laboratory that um, is supported and, and, and has gone through a quality assurance process there, that laboratory should be a uh, uh, position in a way that it can respond to bacterial infections as well as viral, viral infections or parasitic infections so that we do not silo our efforts. I mean, the resources are limited and the only way that you can um, uh, create more, uh, one dollar can fetch you more return on that is really to uh, integrate as much as possible in locations that can be integrated. I think that is very important. Septic is an important uh, a topic, antimicrobial resistance before COVID was what was driving our global health security days. Because if you know, if the statistics we all, you and I are reading are true, it says that up to about 5 million people could be dying of uh, 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 AMR-related um, mm. issues, uh, uh, affection, infections uh, by the, uh, the year 2000 and forgotten the year, but it's not very, very distant, maybe 2030. So that is a very scary statistics. And before, and you see that unfortunate thing is that uh, uh, in, a, in a very uh, um, uh, unorthodox way, I would say that uh, apparently nobody dies of AMR, but everybody dies of, a, of right. AMR. Because yeah. if you have that infection in the hospital, you go through surgery and then you get uh, you get infected, antibiotics are not working anymore and whatever. You don't record it like or you, you died from AMR. You record you died from surgery. <laughs> surgery right, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not counted as, as such, you know, right. and that should be, that is a, a, a challenge that we have. The lack of new antibiotics in the last, couple of years, decades is, is, a, is a concerning issue. So uh, it's, uh, those are the issues that I'll, I'll be elevating and, and, and calling for uh, a platform approach to global herd um, responses. Standing. Uh, Ambassador, while we have you, um, anything else uh, coming up? I know, you know you're gonna be at the sepsis conference. There's, a, there's another conference from the uh, American Society of Microbiology coming up, I think in June. Uh, anything else that you wanna highlight, uh, places that you're gonna be, the talks you're gonna be giving, anything else where we can see you, meet you possibly in a public forum, uh, anything else, please take the floor while we have you. Uh, absolutely. I, uh, I'm committed to uh, the ASM uh, conference in uh, that will be in June. Yeah. And of course, we've talked about the Sepsics conference, and I'm also committed to giving the keynote address at the um, American uh, Tropical Medicine uh, meeting in October. I think that is October 18. Um, so those are the, the, the ones, the meetings that I, I mean, but my message should be fairly consistent. Look, if the messages are so different, then you are not addressing the same issue because the issues don't change every day, right? <laughs> the issues are, I mean, and we have to say it very, very often. And what are the, the, the underlying issues? There are three things that we need to prepare to offer global health services, but global health services do not provide offer themselves. They, they are relying on good systems, good public health systems, uh, to, to, to deliver those services. And that good public health system do not by themselves are not enough. You need strong public health institutions to deliver them, right? For example, the US CDC, you just cannot say, well, let's go into each county and have 10 epidemiologists. You need an institution that is guiding that framing policies around that uh, those system, framing standards and quality and ensuring that they are deployed appropriately where uh, the needs are. So I think that's the, uh, the triangle of, of, of that I want to put. And if you do that, we overlay that by good governance and financing, then we, we will get ourselves a little bit more prepared for the next pandemic than what we, we have been struggling with. Outstanding message, outstanding message. Um, for everybody that is gonna be listening to this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks uh, or watching on our YouTube channel. Again, you've been listening to Ambassador Dr. John Kanglesong, United States Global AIDS Coordinator, Special Representative for Health Diplomacy, 
overseeing the United States President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR. Uh, Ambassador, I, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule again to come talk to us and educate us on some of these topics for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you've been doing the last 30 years. And uh, as we like to say here on our show, thanks so much for helping to create a better tomorrow for millions of people out there via what you do. It's a, just a great story. It was an honor having you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy we finally got to, to do this. We have been meaning to do it for so many uh, months, but I'm pleased we do this. And thank you for what you do in this space, which um, is not usually uh, uh, a favorite space. There's the saying that uh, the broken bridge uh, makes news, but a new bridge doesn't make news. So but <laughs> focusing on the good things that are happening in the space of global health is always uh, is fascinating. And I think I'm sure our population will find um, it is useful. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Be well.